members and the public for their support towards the work of the committee. Thank you very much. Questions. Question one, Honorable Lang Chi Chang. Mr. President, the Railway Development Strategy 2014 recommends the taking forward of seven new railway projects, including the Tumen South Extension. The MTR Corporation Limited, MTRCL, in short, submitted a proposal on the Tumen South Extension to the government in as early as December 2016. On the other hand, it was reported in May this year that the government was considering an idea of constructing an additional railway station near Tumen Swim Pool along the Tumen South Extension, so that the MTRCL could finance the railway construction costs through the revenue from the top side development at that station. In this connection, will the government inform this council first, given that it has been two and a half years since the government received the two and self extension proposal, when the government will respectively announce the alignment of the railway and seek funding approval from this council if necessary? Second, of the details of the idea of constructing a new railway station near the Tumun swimming pool, the details of the top side developments or the changes to be made to the community facilities involved when it will consult the Tumun District Council and this council on that idea. And third, given that in order to take forward the Lentau Tomorrow Vision, the government will conduct an area wide transport study and an engineering feasibility study on the road and rail lanes connecting the Hong Kong Island, the artificial islands in the central waters, Lantau Island and the coastal areas of Tumun and such studies will not be completed until 2023. Whether the implementation timetable of the Tumun South Extension will be affected as a result, if so, of the details. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Thank you, Madam, uh, Mr. President. My consolidated reply to Honorable Lang Chi Cheng's question is as follows. The Transport and Housing Bureau, THB, announced the Railway Development Strategy 2014, RDS 2014, in September 2014. Having regard to transport demand, cost effectiveness, and the development needs of new development areas, the RDS 2014 recommends that seven new railway projects be completed in the planning horizon up to 2031, including the Tumen South Extension. According to the RDS 2014, the Tumen South Extension will extend the West Rail Line by about 2.4 kilometers from the existing Tumen Station to Tumen South. The Tumen South Extension mainly serves to improve railway access to the community south of the current Tumen Tang Center, near Wuking Estate, Shuhei Court, and Yut Wu Villa and connectivity to the Tumun Ferry Pier in order to facilitate the residents to use railway for the journeys. Having regard to the indicative implementation window recommended in the RDS 2014, the THB had invited the MTRCL to submit a proposal for the implementation of the Tumen South Extension. The MTRCL submitted a proposal for this railway project to the government end of December 2016. The THB, the Highways Department and relevant bureaus and departments have evaluated the proposal and asked the MTRCL to provide additional information and supplement details. In carrying out the evaluation, our emphasis is to ensure that the proposal is practically feasible and can bring maximum benefits to the community. Railway projects involve huge capital investment, and the government has to plan in a prudent manner. The new railway projects proposed in the RDS 2014 have different degrees of complexity. As clearly stated in the RDS 2014, the taking forward of individual proposed railway projects set out in the strategy will be subject to the outcome of detailed engineering, environmental, and financial studies relating to each project, as well as updated demand assessment and the availability of resources. Moreover, for railway projects which are mainly intended to complement new development areas and new housing developments, the implementation timetable for the development areas and the new housing developments in question will be an important planning parameter for the railway projects. Therefore, the indicative implementation windows recommended in the RDS 2014 may be adjusted having regard to any change in circumstances. 
in planning the Tumin South Extension, we need to consider the various impacts on nearby residents arising from the proposed alignment and the possible mitigation measures. Due to the tight housing supply and the potential housing supply that may be brought about by railway development, the government is also reviewing the proposal submitted by the MGRCL in this light. Having examined the proposal submitted by the corporation and considered the urgency of the project and the land development potential, this may be that may be brought about. We plan to request MGRCL to commence the detailed planning and design of two months of extension in the coming year, so the work of this project can commence as early as possible. As regards the earlier media reports about the information of the two months of extension, such as station locations and funding arrangement, I would like to take this opportunity to clarify that. The government did not release the information about the extension through any channel or person. As I just mentioned, the government is reviewing the proposal submitted by the MGRCL in the light of the potential housing supply that may be brought about. Since the relevant work is still in progress, we are not in a position to disclose further information about the human self-extension at this stage to avoid causing unnecessary speculation or misunderstanding. I would like to reiterate that, in line with established procedures prior to the finalization of any new railway scheme, we shall consult the public, including the LegCo and the relevant district councils, on the details of the scheme. Besides, the support from the Public Works Subcommittee of the Legislative Council has been obtained in May this year on a funding application for the studies related to artificial islands in the central waters, which includes conducting transport infrastructure study on the road and railway lanes related to the project. Such roads and railway will connect to the transport network along the coastal area of Tun Mun, but their ex exact alignment, mode of construction and implementation program are subject to the findings of the study. Generally speaking, the Tun Mun South Extension project may have connection with a section of the railway related to the artificial islands in the central waters. We will request the MGRCL to make provision for connection points in the Tun Mun South Extension project for interchange and related connection purposes in the future. Besides, the commissioning of railway links related to the artificial islands in the central waters may alter the patronage behaviour of the Tumun South Extension, such as diverting passengers who would otherwise be using the Tumun South Extension or West Rail Line to the railway related to the artificial islands. Nevertheless, the planning of the road and railway links related to the artificial islands in the central waters will not generally affect the implementation program of Tumun South Extension. We will continue to closely liaise with the relevant bureaus and departments for the further planning of the extension, so as to implement the Tumun South Extension as soon as possible. Thank you, President. Honorable Lang Chi Chen. Thank you, Mr. President. In his main reply, the president, uh, the Secretary said that regarding earlier reports about the possible station locations and or funding arrangements of human self-extension, well, um, he has explained and clarified that it's got nothing to do with him. But then I'm afraid the rumours would not have been totally uh, unjustified. If I may seek further clarification, I think earlier this year, I would like to know whether within the administration this was done or was a consultant asked to carry out some work concerning two months of extension. If that is the case, that if it means that it is not a rumour, it is a fact. Now, residents of Toon Moon very much like to see the Toon Moon South Extension being commissioned so as to serve those living in the vicinity of the Toon Moon Ferry Pier. But then the government is stalling. All the time, we have been waiting for it, in fact, for five years, and we haven't got any uh, plan for construction. In the policy address, it is said that the MTRCL will be asked to study the matter further. The crux of the matter is, are you going to entrust it um, to the MTRCL or are you going to identify another operator? Please uh, give us a public clarification. Secretary. President, I'd like to thank Honorable Lang Chi Chang for his question. Two Moon South Extension is an important infrastructure for Northwest New Territories. I can understand the keen demand for such a service in the eyes of the Tumun residents. In relation to our communication and interaction with the MTRCL, 
Well, in 2016, in the month of December, a proposal was submitted by the MTRCL, and then in 2017, we asked for further information to be submitted. I think you would all know that in relation to Toon Moon, as well as the um, artificial islands in the central waters, they are new elements in our planning. We need to take them into account. And in relation to the presence of such new elements, we have to update our plans accordingly. And therefore, we have to take the matter in great details. First of all, we have to consider the demand by the residents, the urgency for such a infrastructural project, as well as in relationship with future projects. And then, in accordance with the established procedures, we consult the relevant district council as well as this legislative council, in addition to other stakeholders, when we collect the proper views. And after that, we'll set out to have the detailed planning and design work. And I hope that uh, I have made it clear to the public. In fact, we know and we want to meet the urgent needs of the public. As to the earlier reports about the so-called uh, design, I have explained we didn't uh, release any information via anybody or any organization. Regarding the detailed design and construction, well, the policy address has already given a clear account. In the coming year, we are going to uh, commence our work regarding three projects, one being the Tumun South Extension. So uh, this is uh, uh, clearly spelled out in the policy address. I hope I will say this for the record. Mr. Michael Tian, the policy address has said that we are going to have a new office to oversee the planning and construction of railway projects. It will come under the Transport and Housing Bureau. I have the idea of having an independent railway development office. So against such a background, I have to say that uh, I support you. Now. We haven't got a, uh, a location available for the Tum Moon South Extension, uh, except the Tum Moon Swim Pool. Now, for the uh, concession approach, now um, you don't need to care about overspending. For the SCL, we have got an uh, overrunning of the budget by $20 billion. It seems that you apply the same to the Lofton Link. What about railway price development model? What is the government's um, sort of uh, concern? Is there any downside so that it was abandoned in the case of the SCL? So I just want to seek your view on such a model, Secretary. I'd like to thank Honorable Michael Tian for his question. Regarding the uh, Railway Development Office, well, I think the THB uh, will give its serious uh, consideration. The purpose is to provide quality railway service, and we would be able to exercise close monitoring on the carrying out of railway projects, making sure that both the schedule as well as the cost will be subject to tight control. The day-to-day -day operation would also be important. Railway safety, passenger safety would also be given priority, so that would come under our uh, study as well. Well, regarding the two self extension, as far as alignment is concerned, as I have said, it is not right for me to disclose any information. Mr. Michael Tian referred to the funding arrangement. Well, other than the railway plus development model, we have also got a sort of cash subsidy uh, model. Now, uh, regarding the detailed planning and design study, we do take into account railway plus development model as well as other alternative funding arrangements. Mr. Michael Tian asked why the railway price development model was not adopted for SCL. I think at that time, the relevant colleagues did consider different funding models. I believe that they gave, uh, cons they considered all sorts of available funding arrangements, and they took into account the special features of the SCL because it's a matter of connecting the eastern side with the western side of the railway networks, and then the KCRC assets has to belong to the um, 
KCR Corporation. So it has complicated things and has been reflected in the actual operation of the railway uh, line. Mr. Kenneth Lang. Thank you, President. Uh, NT West would be uh, an important area for new developments. We are going to have uh, Camp Tin Line, Camp Tin South and Hong Shui Q, uh, new development areas plus uh, Yunnan South. So we are going to get a increase in the population. Would you consider uh, uh, once again the Tu Mun Yunlong uh, railway link so that, I mean, Tu Mun Chun Wan link um, so as to address the transportation needs of the uh, new population. Thank you. For the Tun Mun Chun Wan link, I'm sure both Mr. Lau and other members did refer to this proposal. And we understand that with an increase in population, we need to consider the commuting needs of the population. We need to make sure that they have access to efficient and speedy uh, transport link and railway would be uh, the first uh, choice. For the Tun Mun Chun Wan suggestion, uh, in 2014, as uh, part of the RDS, this was given consideration. Well, uh, in fact, uh, the population density is not evenly distributed, so the patronage may not justify such a link. In future, should population distribution be uh, readjusted in the future? And of course, we have to revisit this topic. And since it is going to have a coastal alignment, uh, we need to understand that along um, the coast between Chun Wan and Tun Mun, I think you need to uh, note the technical difficulties involved. Um, at, that's our understanding at that time, and currently we still believe that the construction cost of such a coastal alignment will be very high. Now, in future, we'll have the artificial islands in the central waters, and together with the developments in the vicinity, uh, that can give us ground for future review. Uh, and of course, we'll consider the road network as well. Not too long ago, we talked about the development of Route 11, as well as Two Moon South Road Improvement Works. All of them will be taken together. So Mr. Lau, if you have got any ideas, I'll be more than happy to take them up after the meeting. I will, of course, benefit from input from members who are present. Dr. Lo Wai Gong, thank you, President. After years of study and consultation, eventually, in September 2014, the THB released the RTS 2014 so that we know uh, that there will be seven new railway projects in the years up to 2031. In other words, Northern Link, uh, Tung, um, Tung Moon South Extension, East Kowloon Line, Tung Chung West Extension, Hong Shui Q Station, South Island Line West, and North Island Line. Both the Council and the public at large have been in support. We look forward to the uh, early completion of such important railway projects that would benefit our livelihood. Unfortunately and regrettably, it was only uh, in the um, new policy address that we were given some certainties in relation to Tung Chung Line extension, Tumun South extension and Northern Link. In relation to the reply given by the STH today, as far as the RDS 2014 is concerned, for the remaining four projects, I just wonder whether they will be completed in 20 uh, or by 2031. I think I've caused to be worried. So I come to my question. Secretary, are you still determined to take forward all the seven new projects instead of just the three? I really hope that the government will be more committed uh, in taking forward the railway projects early decision and early commencement of the construction, please. Secretary, thank you, President. I'd like to thank Dr. Lowe for his question. And then for RDS 2014, we have stated clearly in the related report that uh, we have um, 
said that the implementation windows would depend on the population, um, the feasibility, as well as the development plans, as far as the seven projects were concerned. So uh, 2031 was given uh, against such a background. Since then, we have done a lot of work. And in fact, for five projects, we have asked MTRCL to come up with an initial assessment, and we have received the related reports from the MTRCL. Now for the uh, South Island Line West and Hong Shui Q station, the studies have also been um, uh, invited from the MTRCL. And so for all the seven projects, most of the studies have been completed, some are still underway. And then uh, for the coming financial year, we are going to take forward three major projects and we're going to embark on the detailed planning and design work. All such shows that uh, the government is determined to meet the commuting needs of the population. Dr. Lo asked whether we would be confident to complete all the seven projects by 2031. Well, basically, I hope both Dr. Lo and other uh, council members would understand the following. Back then, when we gave such an idea, it was a preliminary idea as far as the timetable was concerned. It wasn't set as a hard and fast rule. It's not a confirmed timetable. I've made this clear in my main reply. So in the light of developments of our society and the light of our transport and traffic demand and against the background of the tight uh, housing supply, we'll try our best to take forward the projects as early as possible. All of them uh, have different degrees of complexities, like East Kowloon Line as well as the North Island Line. Well, uh, we have identified a lot of difficulties and challenges to be overcome. Uh, the government is still studying the matter. In due course, uh, we will come back to the council to give you uh, an update. Thank you. Question number two, Mr. Yu Si Wing. Thank you, Mr. President. As at the end of February this year, there were a total of 276 government and commercial public car parks disseminating vacancy information of their car parking spaces to the public through Hong Kong e-mobility, a mobile application of the Transport Department. However, the vacancy information of car parking spaces of government car parks disseminated through the application is not real-time, and the application does not cover all commercial public car parks. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the respective current numbers of government and commercial public car parks disseminating vacancy information of their parking spaces through the application, the respective numbers of car parking spaces of these two types of car parks, and their percentages in the relevant totals? Two, of the reasons why the application cannot cover all public car parks in Hong Kong, and three, whether it will make improvements, first by disseminating real-time vacancy information of car parking spaces of government car parks through the application, and then by introducing measures to encourage operators of commercial public car parks to disseminate such information. If so, of the details and timetable, if not, the reasons for that. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, our reply to the various parts of Mr. Yu Wing's question is set out below. One, to promote smart mobility and assist motorists in finding parking spaces, the Transport Department TD disseminated parking vacancy information to the public through its Hong Kong e-routing mobile application since 2016. Subsequently, TD launched in July 2018 an all-in-one mobile application Hong Kong e-mobility, integrating Hong Kong e-routing and two other mobile applications in relation to public transport and driving information to provide one-stop public access to such information. As at the end of September 2019, Hong Kong e-mobility provided parking vacancy information of 28 government public car parks and 302 non-government public car parks, involving over 53,500 parking spaces. Government public car parks 
mainly cover car parks managed by government departments, including TD, Government Property Agency, GPA, and Housing Department, HD. Of the above-mentioned over 53,500 parking spaces, about 6,900 are managed by the government, while the remaining 46,600 parking spaces are in non-government public car parks. These parking spaces account for about 57% and 24% of the total number of parking spaces in these two categories of public car parks, respectively. Two, we understand the community expects the government to disseminate additional real-time parking vacancy information. In this connection, TD has been encouraging other government departments and operators of non-government car parks to provide real-time parking vacancy information and data of their car parks to the public through TD's Hong Kong e-mobility and the government's public sector information portal data.gov.hk. The progress of disseminating real-time parking vacancy information is, nonetheless, subject to other constraints, including that some car parks are not installed with real-time parking vacancy information systems, and that there are no provisions in the existing land leases of non-government car parks requiring car park operators to provide real-time parking vacancy information. TD will continue its efforts to encourage more car park operators to open up their parking vacancy information and data. Three, of the existing 28 government car parks with parking vacancy information disseminated, 11 are managed by TD. To make available additional real-time parking vacancy information of government car parks, except for the Yaomate car park, which will be demolished to make way for the construction of the Central Kowloon Route. TD completed in June 2019 enhancement of the access control systems of 10 multi-storey car parks under its management. The original manual updating of parking vacancy information at half-hourly intervals has thus been upgraded to automatic updating of real-time parking vacancy information for dissemination through Hong Kong e-mobility and data gov data.gov.hk. The above-mentioned 10 multi-storey government car parks involve a total of some 4,700 parking spaces, the real-time parking vacancy information of which has been fully disseminated. As regards the Wong Tai Sin Public Transport Terminus Car Park commissioned in September 2019, TD expects that this real-time parking vacancy information will be disseminated by the end of this year. On the other hand, TD has held follow-up meetings with other government departments for sharing of experience and to brief them on practical technology solutions to facilitate their adoption of suitable measures for collecting and disseminating parking vacancy data. In this connection, GPA, HD and the Leisure and Cultural Services Department have taken steps to incorporate new requirements into their new contracts for car park management requesting car park operators to disseminate parking vacancy information. With the progressive renewal of car park management contracts, we expect that the parking vacancy information of all government car parks could be fully disseminated in three to four years. Regarding non-government car parks, after the discussion with, between TD and the Lands Department, the Lands Department has incorporated since the middle of 2018 provisions into new short-term tenancy agreements of fee-paying public car parks, mandating operators to provide parking vacancy information and data of their car parks to the government. With a gradual replacement of old short-term tenancy agreements by new ones containing the above-mentioned new provisions, TD expects that the number of short-term tenancy car parks providing parking vacancy information will be on the rise. TD will continue to liaise with developers and operators of other non-government public car parks and appeal for and encourage their participation in providing parking vacancy information. In line with the prevailing trend of open data, they will also be encouraged to provide real-time data as early as practicable with a view to promoting smart city development and fostering smart mobility. Indeed, with the TD's efforts in the past few years, some developers and operators of non-government public car parks have been providing relevant information to TD progressively. 
On the other hand, TD will install a total of 12,000 new generation parking meters by batches starting from the first half of 2020. The new parking meters will be equipped with vehicle sensors to detect whether individual parking spaces are occupied and such real-time information and data will be disseminated through TD's website, Hong Kong eMobility and data.gov.hk for reference and use by the public and the, the technology sector. We expect that the installation works will be fully completed in the first half of 2022. Motorists will then be able to get hold of the real-time parking vacancy information of on-street metered parking spaces, which will facilitate their search for parking spaces and help reduce the traffic generated by vehicles circulating on roads in search of parking spaces. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Yu Wing, Secretary, yesterday the Ombudsman published a statement about facilities for electric private cars, and according to this investigation report, the government has not been managing the p parking spaces properly, such that traditional cars usually occupy parking spaces were equipped with charges, leading to the low utilization rate of charges. The Hong Kong e-mobility app at the moment does not provide information about the vacancy of parking spaces for electric cars. My question is whether you would update Hong Kong e-mobility, including the upgrade of its system to provide information about electric car charges to facilitate motorists, and if so, when will it be introduced, and if not, the reasons for that, Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Yusewing, for the question. We also noticed the investigation report and the comments made by the Ombudsman on the use of charges in the car parks by electric cars. The government car parks are equipped with charges for electric cars and parking spaces. And in general, we manage these parking spaces with charges by, for example, allocating these spaces closer to the shop's office so that staff members could manage these spaces better. But of course, there are circumstances when um, drivers of traditional cars would use the space for convenience sake. We also noticed a trend. Say at the moment, if the park the car park is full, save for one or two vacant spaces for electric cars, and if we have a couple of cars using an internal combustion engine trying to get in, must we stop them from using these spaces? It is really arguable. Of course, whether we can provide this information in an integrated manner and publish an information on the internet, we'll go back and consider the suggestion because we also need to consider the effect of providing this information. I will look into it. Thank you. Dr. Lower Kwok. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, what I meant to ask about parking spaces with charges for electric cars whether this could be published through the app. But in fact, Mr. Yu Wing already asked to follow up on the same point. So perhaps I, should, could, I could pick up on this point. Apart from information, I'd like to ask the Secretary whether there is any plan to further increase parking spaces with charges for electric cars in government car parks, whether there is a concrete plan to do so to facilitate the government's promotion on the use of electric cars as a strategy. Secretary, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Dr. Lowe. I understand members would, of course, have noticed that the Environment Bureau has set aside funding for the increased provision of parking spaces for electric cars, especially in private properties. 
the government, of course, will work fully and fully support the work of the Environment Bureau. As deliber deb deliberated in this council before, and it is also com common fact that we are, in general, short of parking spaces. And we need to strike a balance between that and the supply of parking spaces for electric cars. At the same time, there have been discussions among policy bureaus on reducing roadside emission and promoting the use of electric cars. Anyway, our bureau does work and cooperate fully with the Environment Bureau on promoting the use of electric cars and the increase in charges. Your question hasn't been answered. I refer to government car parks because this is where government can take the initiative in increasing the provision of parking spaces for electric cars. There is, of course, another scheme to help private property owners provide charges. So can you answer specifically whether there is any plan to help uh, increase the number of charges in government car parks. Yes, I'll follow that up with the Environment Bureau. Mr. Wilson Orr, thank you, Mr. President. Secretary, no wonder why uh, our members of the public are really at a loss of the government is doing. For example, this mobile application, Hong Kong e-mobility, a lot of money has been sent, uh, spent and the public is really uh, lost about uh, its function. Secretary, you must work harder against the present circumstances in Hong Kong. The public has high expectations on the government. So please work harder and invite your colleagues to tap collective wisdom and help reform the system. Secretary, the problem is we have commercial vehicles and larger vehicles such as lorries and school coaches. And they find it very hard to look for large parking spaces. Are there any ways to help commercial vehicles with parking? Secretary, thank you, Mr. President. Parking spaces has been a topic frequently discussed in this council, and we have communicated uh, on the same matter outside of this council. And the government, in fact, has devised some measures, including allow allowing roadside parking during non-peak hours in the evening. And as far as possible, we strive to provide more parking spaces in government buildings. We also strive to increase the supply of parking spaces on car parks with short-term tenancy agreements. And the measures also include disseminating parking vacancy information to the public in a timely manner. For coaches and other commercial vehicles, we've strived to identify suitable spots in different districts to facilitate their parking. And the government departments have joined hands in striving for more parking spaces. It takes time, however. And we also make use of technology, including a smart car park so that we can maximize the use of land and accommodate more vehicles in a in the same car park. All these take time and perhaps we should wait um, for further assessments. Mr. Edidu. Mr. President, I don't know whether my follow-up question is a bit remote. Since, since Mr. Chu asked about the provision of parking spaces for commercial vehicles, I'd like to ask this question. Secretary, you know the crux of the matter is that the growth of private car in number exceeds the increase in number of parking spaces. This leads to the shortage of uh, car, uh, or of parking spaces. In fact, the TAC already recommends the government uh, to uh, devise measures to suppress the growth of private cars. I don't think this th question is directly related to the oral question. Anything to add, Secretary? If not, well, I have nothing to add, Mr. President. Mr. Long Chi Chang. Mr. President, it is not easy to promote uh, 
to promote the idea of smart city. The Hong Kong NCL government has been acting very slowly. In the main reply, the secretary mentioned that even for government car parks managed by car park operators, this cannot be implemented until the agreements have been renewed. It's really disappointing. We have a severe shortage of parking spaces in Hong Kong now. And when we approve funding for public works projects in this council, we un we notice even in government buildings, parking spaces are not sufficient. Uh, the government ha departments, however, are deterred from asking for more because the Transport and Housing Bureau never acknowledges the fact that we are short of parking spaces. So my question, Secretary, is as the policy bureau in charge of the matter within the government, will you strive for more parking spaces for the public uh, in new government building projects? I don't think this question is related to the original question. Do you have anything to add, Secretary? Mr. President, perhaps after the meeting, allow me to explain in greater detail to these two members with their questions. Mr. Aulokhim, I'm the Secretary of the Owners' Operation. Secretary, my question is, if a housing estate wants to increase uh, parking spaces or provide parking vacancy information, it is impossible unless the land lease is modified. So is there any way for the government to help owners' corporations find more parking spots for the public. Secretary, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Ao. The question focuses on parking spaces for the public in public car parks, including government-run car parks and also privately-run car parks on government land. And you just referred to ancillary car park that is parking spaces within private premises. And that depends on the view of the owner's corporation on the matter. Say if there is already a limited number of parking spaces and if we or if they wish to install real-time parking vacancy information systems and vehicle sensors and to publish the information online, we definitely welcome that. But it depends on the view of the OC, which is which has autonomy over the matter. Of course, if we are to promote smart city, smart mobility, and to reduce the effort of Car park, uh, uh, of drivers in circling, circulating on roads in search of parking spaces and hence reducing uh, traffic congestion. We welcome that. So be it car parks on the short term tenancy agreements or car parks on private properties, we spare no effort in promoting the use of real time parking vacancy information systems and disseminating this information on the internet. This is, of course, our wish, but I've also explained the practical difficulties. Say, for a private property development, if the number of private residential flats are limited with limited parking spaces, there may be practical operational difficulties. The third question, requesting an oral reply. Members, please stop shouting. If you continue, to shout, I will regard that as a display of gross disorderly conduct. Mr. Andrew Wen, will you ask your question? President, quite a number of members of the ethnic minorities, EM, wish to apply for the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region passport to facilitate their traveling and studying abroad. 
as only Chinese citizens may apply for the passport, they have to apply for naturalization as a Chinese national. Despite having resided in Hong Kong for years, quite a number of them, and their older generations were born and raised in Hong Kong, they have encountered quite a number of difficulties when applying for naturalization, including that they need to wait for a long time and pay high fees, and they are not informed of the reasons when their applications are rejected, and no appeal channel is available. As a result, such EM members who regard Hong Kong as their home have lost the sense of belonging to Hong Kong. Some of them even chose to emigrate to other countries. Regarding applications for naturalization by EM members, will the government inform this council one of the respective numbers of naturalization applications received, approved, and rejected by the Immigration Department, as well as the number of applications withdrawn in each of the past 10 years together with a tabulated breakdown by ethnicity? Two, given that the Immigration Department will, in processing naturalization applications, consider ten factors, such as whether the applicant has the right of vote in Hong Kong, whether the applicant has sufficient knowledge of the Chinese language, of the minimum number of such factors for which applicants must attain positive scores in order to, for the applications to be considered, whether it will regard the applicant's duration of residence in Hong Kong as one of the factors of solve the details of not the reasons for that, and three, Given that under existing legislation, Immigration Department is not required to state any reason for its de decisions to reject naturalization applications, and applicants may not lodge any appeal against such decisions, whether the government will amend the relevant provisions so that EM whose naturalization applications have been rejected will not feel confused and discriminated against. If so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Security. President, in accordance with the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Passports Ordinance, Cap 539, Laws of Hong Kong, one of the conditions for the issuance of a Hong Kong Special Administrative Region or Hong Kong SAR passport is that the applicant must be a Chinese citizen. According to Article 18 of and Annex 3 to the Basic Law of the Hong Kong SAR, the Nationality Law of the People's Republic of China, CNL, has been applied to the Hong Kong SAR since the 1st of July, 1997. The Standing Committee of the National People's Congress has also endorsed the explanations of some questions by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress concerning the implementation of the Nationality Law of the People's Republic of China in Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, the explanations, and authorized the Hong Kong SAR government to designate its immigration department to handle applications related to Chinese nationality in the Hong Kong SAR in accordance with the CNL and the explanations. Furthermore, the Hong Kong SAR government enacted the Chinese Nationality Miscellaneous Provisions Ordinance Cap 540 in 1997 to stipulate the implementation details of nationality application, form of application, and charges, etc. My response to the questions raised by the Honorable Andrew Wan is as follows. From 2009 to 2018, the Immigration Department received a total of 14,645 applications for naturalization as a Chinese national, of which 10,844 were approved, 1,707 refused, and 228 withdrawn or not processed further. And the remaining 1,800 are being processed, or they were applied for and completed in different years. Please refer to Table 1 for a breakdown of the number of applications by year. Applicants with the naturalization applications approved from 2009 to 2018 mainly originated from the nationalities of India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Please refer to Table 2 for a breakdown of the number of applications received and approved by original nationalities. Pursuant to Article 7 of the CNL, foreign nationals or stateless persons 
who are willing to abide by the China constitution and laws and who meet one of the following conditions may be naturalized upon approval of their applications. A. They are near relatives of Chinese nationals. B. They have settled in China. Or C. They have other legitimate reasons. Any person who meets the requirements of the CNL can apply to the Immigration Department for Naturalization as a Chinese national. In processing an application for naturalization as a Chinese national, the Immigration Department will consider whether the applicant meets the relevant requirements stipulated in the CNL. It will also consider the merits of each application. In general, without regard to the race, color or religion of the applicant, consideration will be given to the following factors. Whether the applicant has a near relative who is a Chinese national having the right of abode in Hong Kong. Whether the applicant has the right of abode in Hong Kong. Whether the applicant's habitual residence is in Hong Kong. Whether the principal members of the applicant's family, meaning spouse and minor children, are in Hong Kong. Whether the applicant has a reasonable income to support himself, herself, and his or her family. Whether the applicant has paid taxes in accordance with the law. Whether the applicant is of good character and sound mind. Whether the applicant has sufficient knowledge of the Chinese language. Whether the applicant intends to continue to live in Hong Kong in case the naturalization application is approved. And whether there are other legitimate reasons to support the application. The Immigration Department will take into full account the above factors and make decisions on a fair and appropriate basis. Whether the applicant lives in Hong Kong is one of the factors to be considered. Each application will be handled on its merits. and its assessment will not be based on a single criterion. Therefore, in assessing an application, there is no such requirement that the applicant must meet a certain number of criteria before his or her application for naturalization as a Chinese national will be approved. Likewise, failing to meet any individual criterion above does not necessarily mean that the applicant application will be refused. The Immigration Department implements the CNL in the Hong Kong SAR in accordance with the requirements of the Chinese Nationality Miscellaneous Provisions Ordinance. Section 51B of the Ordinance Concerning Nationality Application applies only to decisions in, in the exercise of discretion. In exercising discretion to handle applications for naturalization as a Chinese national, the Immigration Department often needs to consider sensitive information, such as whether the applicants are of good character. It is therefore not appropriate to disclose the reasons behind the decision. Decisions made after considering relevant factors are the result of the exercise of discretion rather than findings in law or facts. If an appeal mechanism is allowed for such decisions, then the final decision will be made by the appellate authority instead of the Immigration Department, which is designated by the Hong Kong SAR government to implement the CNL as authorized by way of the explanations. Applicants who are not satisfied with the application results may request the Immigration Department in writing to review the applications, all reviews will be handled fairly. In addition, applicants whose Hong Kong SAR passport applications are refused can lodge an appeal with the Hong Kong SAR Passports Appeal Board. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Wen. President. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, you spoke softly. President. I'm not happy with the reply of the Secretary. If you look at the data provided, these EMs who have been in Hong Kong for generations, about a third or a quarter of the applications have been refused. I'm most unhappy with the transparency of information. My question is, it is not classifying EM according to the classic classification system of the Home Affairs Department or the Census and Statistics Department. According to our observation, 
those who may easily get naturalization, like uh, Europeans, they lump them together in the same group. So the information is not clear, and it may lead to misjudgment. I'd like to ask whether you can provide more accurate and transparent information and promise that under the Immigration Department, you can set up an appeal board, which is made up of by independents, so the information will become clear and transparent. Secretary. Thank you. President. The information we provide represent the most commonly seen nationalities who make up the bulk of applications. If you refer to my reply, we are talking about any foreign national or stateless person. So which original nationality a person belongs to is not relevant. We will only consider the three factors in my main reply, that is whether they have a near relative of uh, who is a Chinese national, whether they have settled in China, and whether they have other legitimate reasons. The Immigration Department, for the sake of transparency, has stated the te 10 factors that they consider. Therefore, we have given full consideration to the fact that members would like to know more information, and so the information is supplied to the Legislative Council. As to the proposal to set up an appeal board, whether or not it's made up of uh, certain persons, I've explained in the main reply why that is not supported. And the law also states clearly, and also according to CNL and the explanations, it is clearly stated that those who apply for Chinese nationality in Hong Kong, these will be decided by the Immigration Department. If we set up any appeal mechanism, then finally the decision will be made by an appellate body. That decision will not be in line with the CNL and the explanations and the Chinese nationality ordinance as applied in Hong Kong. Mr. Vincent Chang. Uh, sorry, which part of your supplementary has not been answered? I asked very clearly that as for the classification, can you have a further breakdown according to common categorization system used by other departments? Uh, Secretary, I will ask the Immigration Department to compile the figures. Mr. Vincent Cheng, thank you. The Immigration Department, in processing the applications for naturalization, it will avail itself to the 10 factors. Let me not say whether they are reasonable or subjective, but then uh, such information can be easily investigated into uh, whether they have a right of abode, whether they have habitual residence in Hong Kong, whether they have reasonable income. But then we have heard from Pakistani women that they applied for naturalization and also for a Hong Kong passport, but then they waited a whole year before they were told that the applications were refused. I like to ask, what procedures apply to such applications? Why did they take a year? Is it because of a lack of manpower or other reasons? Will that be reviewed? Will the procedure be um, expedited? Secretary, thank you. In processing applications for naturalization, the Immigration Department has this performance pledge, and that is In processing the applications, 80% will be completed within three months. And as a matter of fact, the Immigration Department's performance has actually reached 91%, um, it, meaning processing 91% of cases within three months, so they have fulfilled their performance pledge. Why is it that some, some applications cannot be completed within three months? Well, the procedure of the Immigration Department is such that in the first time, the department interviews the applicant. Usually, the applicant will go to the Immigration Department to seek information. Then the staff will explain to them the information, including the 10 factors that are usually considered. And if the applicant decides to hand in the application, the procedure will be started, and six weeks will be 
allowed for the submission of information. But some people may take longer to submit information, and they may be required to supplement the information. Then, usually, the immigration department requires the submission of information within six weeks, and if that is not done, the applicant will be given four more weeks, and. If they still don't do it, then there will be another two weeks. So altogether, twelve weeks. In certain cases, the information submitted is always insufficient. Or when they are asked to submit further information, they take a long time. That is why some cases required a longer time for processing. And the immigration department has already added. Extra manpower for these cases. Say in establishment, they have only six staff members for such cases. But then to expedite the process, the immigration department has already redeployed resources so that there are now sixteen officers responsible for such naturalization applications. I hope members understand that each case is unique. If information is supplied in good time, so the immigration department can make a decision. Usually, these can be processed within three months, and in ninety-one percent of the cases, that is the case. Thank you, Mrs. Regina Ip. President, the immigration department of Hong Kong has the authority. Delegated to it by the central authorities to process applications for naturalization, and this is done by way of an explanation done by the NPC before the handover. And in Hong Kong, we are in a way rather lenient. I'd like to ask you whether the central authorities have talked to you about the criteria and whether、um, they have said anything about the figures. Because as far as I understand, the criteria are much more strict if applications are made on the mainland. Secretary, thank you. We are independent when we process such applications. We are aware that the mainland has not announced. The number of applications for naturalization, but then we understand that、um, there was a general survey on the mainland in the year two thousand and thereafter. We could see that five hundred thousand foreign nationals resided in the mainland. Then this was done in in twenty ten, and it was said that. Five hundred and ninety-four thousand foreign nationals were then residing on the mainland, and only fourteen hundred were naturalized as Chinese citizens. Therefore, if you use these figures for a kind of non-scientific reference, you can see that our approval for naturalization. Reaches about seventy-five percent on average. Therefore, I think that in this regard, the immigration department has processed applications according to the law and the merits of the case. I think they have given these cases appropriate consideration. Mr. Oh, not him. John Lee, step down. My question is: In part two. Of the main reply, there is a basket of factors. If these are not given priority, there would be a problem. There was this Pakistani man, whose wife is Chinese. Well, he broke the law before, but then he has lived in Hong Kong for five to six years now, and he only has a certificate of recognizance. I like to know how many times he has to appeal before he can be naturalized. Is it that he will never be naturalized? Is it that even if he appeals? Innumerable times, he will always be refused because of a record of breaking the law. Secretary, thank you, President. The Immigration Department gives comprehensive consideration to all factors relating to each case. I explain to members that the Immigration Department would consider a list of ten factors in processing each case. 
if the applicant is of good character, well, that is, of course, one factor for consideration, but that is not the single factor. The Immigration Department may make a decision because of a certain situation applied to a, applying to a case, and it makes comprehensive consideration of these cases. And also, there is a review mechanism. If anyone thinks that his application should be reconsidered, he can apply for a review. Apart from that, the Immigration Department allows applicants to make a second application. And it happened that the Immigration Department approved applications that were a second or third application. Therefore, every time uh, the decision is made on the actual situation of each case. Question four. Dr. Chen Chung Chai. First, I would like to deal with a point of order. It has to do with my question. So my question uh, was uh, on the uh, impact of the extradition bill to uh, Hong Kong economy. However, this question is delayed to October. And due to the restriction to the RP, I'm not able to amend my question. But later, if the Secure, the secretary would not leave. It was supposed to announce the withdrawal of the bill, and in view of the government response, it seems to uh, shift the, all the blame on the Hong Kong people and the protesters. And later on, I would not move my or question. And according to uh, RB twenty six eight B, and any. Uh, uh, questions cannot be retracted. However, in the exception of circumstances, for our question, only when no other members object, they would then only object to withdraw our question. Would any uh, a member object to Ms. Dr. Chen withdrawing his question? Since a mem some members object to this, Ms. Dr. Chen may may not reach withdrew his question. Miss Lee, can you please um, ask your question number four? Just um, a member of the highest proceedings present. Mr. Lee may ask question number four. If ma'am is not present, if uh, if the member is not present, uh, would that question be skipped? No. The question will be asked by the. Uh, most senior presiding member, in this case the chairman of the House Committee, will ask on the member's behalf. And now the starly is the most senior members present. She may ask the question. I'm a supplement. I object to this because I, th I thought that um, I prepared my supplementary response. That's why I object to the withdrawal. The question earlier on. The legislative amendments concerning the surrender of the fugitive offenders proposed by the government have aroused the concerns of the international community. The United States China Economic and Security Review Commission of the United States, the European Union, EU Office to Hong Kong and Macau, and diplomatic representatives of EU member states, as well as the International Chamber of Commerce Hong Kong, have raised objections one after another. They are worried about the safety of businessmen, journalists, rights and interests of advocates and political activists in Hong Kong in the wake of the passage of the legislative amendments and deterioration of Hong Kong's freedom level of the rule of law and business environment. In addition, the U.S. government warned the Hong Kong government in May this year not to allow an Iranian oil tanker to birth at Hong Kong or provide replenishments to that oil tanker. Also, quite a number of businessmen are worried about the international status of Hong Kong being shaken as a result of Hong Kong being caught in the crossfire of the trade war between China and the U.S.
in this connection with the government informed this council one what it has assessed the impact of the unfortunate uh, incidents on Hong Kong international image and of the countermeasures to be adopted by the government and two what it has assessed if there will be an exodus of overseas enterprises and professionals from Hong Kong for worries of deterioration of human rights situation and business environment in Hong Kong if it had assessed and the outcome in the affirmative of the countermeasures if the outcome negative the reasons for that Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. President, and thank you, Ms. Lee. In the past four months, the Fugitive Offenders and Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matter Legislation Amendment Bill 2019. The bill have caused controversy in society. Hong Kong experienced many large and scale small scale demonstration, possession, and rallies, many of which have turned into violent incidents. Some of the radical acts of the demonstrators, including blockage of the airport, vandalism of MTR facilities, and street violence, have definitely affected Hong Kong International's image and raised concern on whether Hong Kong is still a safe city. In fact, so far, 40 countries have issued advice on traveling to Hong Kong. Other than impairing Hong Kong international image, the impact of social conflict has spread to all business sectors, among them tourism, retail, and catering industry bear the brunt. Businesses have plummeted, and sectors are facing unprecedented severe challenges. Take conventions, exhibition, and tourism events as an example. Recently, a number of large-scale outdoor events, such as the Hong Kong Wine Dine Festival and the Hong Kong Cyclothon, have been cancelled one after another. Fortunately, with careful arrangements by the organizers, most of the indoor conventions and exhibitions were held smoothly, and most of the exhibitors and buyers visited as planned for carrying out procurement activities in Hong Kong. In addition to our internal problems, on the external front, as a result of the ongoing trade war between the mainland and the U.S., global economic growth has slowed down, bringing direct and indirect negative impact on the Hong Kong economy. Since July this year, there have been a sharp reduction in visitors' arrival and retail sales, a continued decline in export, as well as deeply dampened business investment and consumption sentiments. Certain industries have recorded the worst business performance ever. It is very likely that the Hong Kong economy has already slipped into a technical recession in the third quarter. In mid-August, the government had lowered the economic growth forecast for 2019 to 0-1%. To Nevertheless, we have yet not seen any large-scale outflow of capital and talents. Hong Kong institutional strength and core competencies are still recognized by many international institutions. However, should demonstration persist and escalate, it will have a longer-term impact on our business environment and make the subsequent recovery process more difficult. The government understands the pressure borne by the small and medium enterprises and members of the public amid an economic downturn. We announced in August and September, respectively, two rounds of support measures for enterprises to safeguard jobs. For example, strengthening protection for exporters, assisting enterprises to diversify their developments, upgrade and restructuring their business operations, and to develop new markets. To further support enterprise in common with cash flow requirements, we have recently introduced arrangements for a principal moratorium of more than maximum of 12 months, during which only interest payments have to be made. For the tourism industry, the government, in conjunction with the Travel Industry of Hong Kong and Hong Kong Tourism Board, rolled out last month various measures to support the trade and tackle the current economic difficulties, including fees and rental waiver, subsidy on professionals' training, etc. Just yesterday, the Financial Secretary further announced a new round of measures to support enterprises and safeguard jobs. The government will maintain close communication with the trade and introduce further support measures if necessary. President, uh, together with the uh, TIC and the Tourism Board, have just announced uh, a support measure for the tourism, a, a, tra a cash incentive to help the travel agencies, and based on the number of uh, customers, they received a subsidy. I hope that these measures can provide a timely assistance. Once again, call on the demonstrators to stop violence 
and community return to rational dialogue. Once peace is restored, we will, in collaboration with the relevant organization, Chamber of Commerce, and professional bodies, devote more effort and resources to carry promotional work and other measures to rebuild international confidence in Hong Kong as soon as possible. Mr. Lee. And President, at this time, um, Hong Kong has hit hard. Besides tarnishing our image, the daily lives of the citizens have been greatly disrupted. And every Saturday, people wouldn't dare to go out. They wouldn't uh, go to the protest hotspots. Besides, every day, the MTR, the public would have to make sure to catch the MTR for the last train. And during the weekdays in different districts, there will be a riotous incidents taking place. President, the Secretary had a duty as part of the political team to restore social order ASAP and to uh, uh, sh the public can well, go out safely and the shops will not be vandalized. Secretary, tree, as the commerce for econ commerce and economic development, they see many sh shops with a Chinese PRC background that are repeatedly vandalized because some of the People have spoken in the United Nations or uh, using various ways to harass the uh, merchants and affecting their business. Besides launching a series of support measures, as the shops most want you to restore order as soon as possible so that business can return as normal. Earlier, I see the chief executive had went to the mosque to apologize. Have the secretary had Uh, a, a, a find out from the affected shops to find the extent of the damage and find out what they hope the government can do so that they can uh, uh, survive this uh, tough period. So what kind of message do you get from them? If you didn't have them, what have you planned to do so? Secretary. I agree uh, with the Miss Lee observation. Hong Kong's uh, Problem lies, and there are violence uh, from occurring from time to time. I suppose that this security secretary and his team would notice the problem. There's not only the law enforcement agency; the citizens are, would be affected in one way or the other. For whether it's shops or individuals or uh, homes, it would have been illegally attacked. I believe that the society should not tolerate or. Uh, I'll glorify this, I should, I should condemn all any violence acts. In this period, the entire cabinet, including myself, in our work, we will discuss uh, any measures can curb the violence and to work towards reconciliation. Besides the law enforcement agencies in my portfolio, we have I've been discussing with different chamber of commerce and associations. And for the individual uh, merchants, regardless of the reason being attacked, the law enforcement agencies, when uh, receive report, they will act on them. We will adopt measures to help the sectors uh, to uh, survive this tough period. However, these measures cannot just only benefiting targeted shops and individuals. We can see for the retail and the food and beverage and the tourism related sectors, or uh, and under re retail shops have been attacked or be affected due to the protests, we hope to offer them uh, some help. In my main reply, for all these measures within my portfolio, uh, we'll offer them whenever we can. Christopher Chow, Ms. Lee, which part of the question have been answered? My question is cl clear. Some of the shops that have been especially targeted, especially those of the uh, China background, whether the bookstore and restaurants, due to their background, well, as we know, the Maxim group, because um, they had said something at the UN forum, thus being harassed. Her secretary has shown concern for this uh, hardest hit shop, yes or no? Can you let us know? Since it occurred, have you talked to them and what have you got from them? Secretary, we didn't uh, do this on particular sh uh, shops, but I agree with Miss Lee. On the individual or corporate level, uh, 
they shouldn't be uh, subject to any attack due to the remarks they make or their background. That's not permitted by the law. To allow this kind of uh, destruction, as a pluralistic society, we should have mutual respect. In this situation, for the shops that were subject or targeted for attack, I would like to show our condolences and if I have the time, uh, like for the past period, the different Chamber of Commerce Association have maintained close dialogue, which I shall continue. Christopher Chow, President, on this question that was asked by uh, Dr. Chang, I found it rather strange. For, for the past few months, somebody had been uh, mobilizing this uh, movement that lasts for four months for uh, blocking of the airports and throwing uh, fire bombs and burning shops and MTR, destroying traffic lights. As of present, is still r raging. And Hong Kong's reputation as the safest city is in tatters. And someone went to the U.S. urged to pass legislation to uh, impose sanctions on Hong Kong and the China. That's the this is the most severely damaging to our business environment and reputation. May I ask the government any remedy measures in maintaining the rule of law and stepping up enforcement and even uh, safeguarding the life and property of investors and the public? What can the government do? to restore confidence in foreign investor and to salvage our international image. Secretary. President, what's mentioned by Christopher Chang is plain for everyone to see. Uh, to adopt isolated measures in the short term to uh, turn around our image abroad or whatever misunderstanding on Hong Kong, that would be very challenging. As in the past, our international image was not built in one day. While some of the violent protests is still ongoing, it's hard for me to convince other countries and, and claiming that um, Hong Kong is as safe as in the past. However, we shall be pragmatic in uh, uh, communicate the real situation in Hong Kong through different chambers of commerce and to consulates. Uh, within my portfolio, and uh, well, whether for uh, business visitors or the international conferences, a uh, uh, reception organization, whether the departments and the organizer will need to take an extra step to explain the situation. Over the past quarter, we have uh, written five times to the uh, uh, Foreign Chamber of Commerce, uh, which have outlined both negative and positive uh, picture, which to give them an accurate understanding. Currently, the rioters act affecting Hong Kong should be stopped as long as they continue. All other livelihood and commercial activities will be directly hit. And with our, I also did a lot of work with our close trading partners, which involving myself and my team, as well as our um, uh, economic and trade office, we work with the. Uh, Chamber of Commerce and Professional Bodies in liaise while doing an overseas visit and trying to explain to them this kind of work, even though it's been challenging for the past few months, had never stopped. Even though we are prepared for the worst, we have to be prepared for the future. We hope that when a society gradually restores order and towards reconciliation, we want to uh, later foundations, for example, for the travel industry or external promotion, hopefully someday when the social atmosphere uh, subsided, we can gather our strength and uh, reset. So that will require uh, everyone's hands on deck besides the government. Mr. Dan Squawk. President. Secretary, in your main reply, you mentioned 
the Fugitive Offender Spell. That's quite ironic. So this problem was instigated by Starly of the DAB. Another instigator will be this Secretary Secretary sitting at the back of you. I will call him the Secretary because he should step down immediately as be accountable four months ago. And yet he had the guts to sit here. My question is simple. Mr. Yu, as part of the government's team, you made uncle into this mess for this bill. Can you ask yourself, do you agree that the Mr. Lee City at back of you should resign right away? Mr. L Secretary, if members continue to heckle, I will rule your e behavior as disorderly. I will order you out and eject you from the chamber. I've asked myself for the current situation in Hong Kong. It was due to a po single policy mishap that the government uh, will not evade responsibility. As for the mess caused by the FOA bill, the chief executive and his team had already given a account accountable. And there are other things that give rise from the FOA bill, which include the violent activities. No matter the reason I also asked it as part of the Hong Kong, I don't believe that this a uh, reasonable and sufficient merit to put Hong Kong in what is now. And to put this question in Lashka, regardless of the questioner, we need to work towards a common goal. We hope the, the society can move towards reconciliation. If we can rec well, that this, I need to have few prerequisites. First, that we have to stop all the violent, be uh, illegal behavior that the government must adopt all the necessary improvement measures whether to work for social reconciliation or to step up dialogue or in this difficult period in coming up with a different measures to alleviate the impact. I also hope that all LegCo members can be pragmatic and also need to safeguard the collective interests and dignity of Hong Kong in doing its own duty whether at home and abroad to do what they ought to do because Hong Kong reputation is more than a shop sign. Is that oh, we we have a lot of bilateral uh, cooperation with uh, the place around the world as besides commercial interests and civilian exchanges. I hope and uh, my reply is not to assign blame to anyone. I hope this is a shared responsibility, especially this is our legislature. I hope that in this chamber in this difficult period, we can seek a way out. Thank you. Sec uh, Mr. Ted Hoy, which part of the question not answered? I'm asking, do you think Mr. Lee should resign? That's not part of the uh, core question. I had give my um, personal interpretation of, of the uh, views. Mr. Ted Hoy, Mr. Lee, just now Mr. Dennis Kwok uh, uh, alleged that myself and the DAB is the instigator of the Fugitive Offenders Bill. In accordance to the RP, I want him to illustrate uh, what to mean by that. The DAB, as the political party to help the Poon family, we have been asking the government to handle this homicide case properly. Uh, we have no regrets of helping the victim's family. Thus, we've been. Um, Lobbying the government to uh, hand to, to over the uh, offenders, and we also offer support when the government launched this bill. And this is in the public knowledge. When it's a huge controversy erupted, we will all said that we will understand the government withdraw the bill. I hope that um, you should not commit uh, political smearing, Mr. Ted Hui. Speaking of our international image, over the past four months, the global community has clearly witnessed that Hong Kong's of freedom and democracy have uh, 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 regressed. It, right for the launch of the FOO bill and for the crampdown on the right to illegal assembly and arbitrary arrest, none of them have been positive for Hong Kong. The global community also witnessed that the Hong Kong have been steadfast in fighting for democracy and freedom, and which offer a lot of support. And the 
Norway, uh, Norway and Belinda member have nominated Hong Kong people for the Nobel Peace Prize. May I ask the government, what is the government's position on Hong Kong people in the running for the Nobel Peace Prize? Do you agree that when Hong Kong people are fighting for peace and democracy, do you acknowledge their efforts? President, like I, uh, in my reply to another member, if it's due to a policy mishap, the, the government we need to reflect. And the current situation also involved all Hong Kong citizens. That's why we need to work together to safeguard it and take responsibility. And for the human rights and freedom of Hong Kong, whether as a government official or as someone who lived in Hong Kong all his life, Hong Kong human rights and freedom has been protected and in basic law after the reunification. I will see the different international media can uh, come and leave Hong Kong freely. Well, the media have their own views to Hong Kong people form their own opinion on this. Hong Kong people actually. Uh, decide on themselves instead of other uh, countries um, to comment on the human rights situation. I suppose Hong Kong people is best to answer the question. Which part haven't been answered? Do you acknowledge the effort of Hong Kong people in fighting for freedom and democracy? Anything to ask, Secretary? I already gave a comprehensive answer to Mr. Hui's question. He later the second part of the question simply simplified the first part of the question uh, for a quick answer. I hope that you can uh, check carefully my answer. Question number five, um, Mr. Charles Small. It is stipulated in Article 10 of the Hong Kong Bill of Rights that everyone shall have the right to a fair and public trial. According to Article 3F of the United Nations Model Treaty on Extradition, Extradition shall not be granted if the person whose extradition is requested has not received or would not receive in the requesting state the minimum guarantees in criminal proceedings as contained in Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Covenant, or the Surrender of Fugitive Offenders Agreement, or SFO, Agreements signed between Hong Kong and 20 jurisdictions were implemented after going through this Council's legislative procedure for subsidiary legislation. In this connection, will the government inform this Council, one, whether it knows among the jurisdictions which have signed SFO agreements of Hong Kong, the respective jurisdictions that have and have not implemented the covenant, as well as the respective numbers of them? How the government, at an institutional level, ensures the provision of a fair trial and human rights protection for Hong Kong people subsequent to their being surrendered, whether it would add to the whether it would add the relevant protection provisions to the legislation, if not of the reasons for that, to whether it has assessed if a situation would emerge in which a fair trial and human rights protection for Hong Kong people is undermined as a result of their being surrendered. If it has assessed and the outcome is in the affirmative, whether such a situation will affect the commercial, trade and other relations with, between Hong Kong and foreign countries. And three, whether the government assessed before and after signing an SFO agreement with a certain jurisdiction, if there were serious discrepancies between the legal provisions and the actual enforcement of such provisions in that jurisdiction, if it made such an assessment and found the existence of such a situation, how the government handled the relevant SFO agreements as, so as to ensure the provision of a fair trial and human rights protection for those Hong Kong people who have been surrendered? Mr. Johnny should step down. Well, I have already warned members that if you continue to shout at your seats, I'll have to ask you to leave. Secretary for Security. President, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region government has been actively taking forward cooperation with other jurisdictions concerned on surrender of fugitive offenders, SFO, and mutual legal assistance in criminal matters, MLA, 
under the framework of the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance, FOO, and Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters Ordinance, MLAO, the Juris Jurid Juridical Assistance Framework has been expanded through signing relevant agreements with more jurisdictions. With a view to enhancing international cooperation in combating crimes, the current uh, FLO provides a legal basis for SFO between Hong Kong and other jurisdictions. My reply to the three parts of uh, Mr. Charles Moss' question is as follows. One, before commencing negotiation on entering into an SFO agreement with the relevant jurisdiction, Hong Kong SAR government would consider a host of factors including the jurisdiction's relevant legislation on SFO and the bilateral agreements already signed, as well as the average visitor flow, economic and social relationships between Hong Kong and that jurisdiction, etc. SFO agreement is a bilateral agreement on an equal and mutual basis. The model text used by the Hong Kong SAR government for negotiating long-term SFO agreements were formulated by the Sino-British Joint Liaison Group before Hong Kong's reunification and is in line with the international common practices. After reunification, the government has passed the model text to the Legislative Council for reference. In fact, all long-term agreements are subject to legal uh, scrutiny by way of subsidiary legislation in order to have legal effect. Whether or not a jurisdiction is a contracting state to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, is not a prerequisite for signing a long-term SFO agreement with Hong Kong. At present, Hong Kong has signed long-term bilateral SFO agreements with 20 jurisdictions, among which 18 jurisdictions, that is, Australia, Canada, Czech, Finland, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Ireland, the Netherlands, New Zealand, the Philippines, Portugal, the Republic of Korea, Sri Lanka, South Africa, the United Kingdom, and the United States are contracting states to ICCPR, and the remaining two, i.e. Malaysia and Singapore, are not. According to Section 3, Bracket 1 of FOO, the procedures under FFO are subject to limitations, restrictions, exceptions, and qualifications which may be contained in long-term SFO agreements signed between Hong Kong and the relevant jurisdictions. Therefore, mutually agreed clauses could be added to the agreements as the case may require during negotiation between the two parties. For example, all the 20 long-term SFO agreements signed by Hong Kong contain provisions regarding or uh, relating to discretionary refusal on surrender on humanitarian grounds. Besides, according to Section 13.1b of FOO, the Chief Executive has the uh, power to refuse to surrender to a person in Chiang Chui Ping against the Chief Executive of the Hong Kong SAR and uh, another. The court held that the Chief Executive has the power to refuse surrender if it would be wrong, oppressive, or unjust to order the surrender. The person concerned is therefore entitled to make representations to the Chief Executive or seek judicial review to oppose the surrender, including claiming that it is wrong, oppressive, or unjust to order the surrender, and raising other humanitarian grounds or safeguards provided for in the applicable law or relevant surrender agreements. The existing human rights protection and procedural safeguards under FOO are in line with international common SFO practices. If the person concerned thinks that his right may be prejudiced, he may apply for judicial review against the order issued by the chief executive. Reasons for making representation or raising objection may include Apart from surrender restrictions in FLO and justifications specified in related SFO agreements, relevant grounds as provided for in the Basic Law and Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance. 2. SFO is an international consensus to fight organized and cross-boundary crimes, and is also a globally accepted means to reduce crimes effectively. 
FOO targets fugitives who have committed serious crimes and does not affect lawful commercial activities and individuals' rights and freedoms which are protected by the law. The current FOO is in line with international common practices and has struck a balance between serving the purpose of SFO and ensuring human rights protection and procedural safeguards. As at the 31st of December 2018, 109 fugitives were surrendered by Hong Kong to other jurisdictions under bilateral agreements and multilateral treaties. The human rights of the person concerned are protected by Hong Kong courts through the surrender process. He may also apply for judicial review against the procedure or decision of his surrender under the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance or other applicable laws and appeal all the way up to the Court of Final Appeal. The Court may make its decision by drawing reference from relevant cases, including related cases or of other common law jurisdictions. These cases include whether or not the requesting party could provide the additional human rights protection assurance requested by the requester party in respect of that case. If the person concerned consider the chief executive decision illegitimate, irrational or procedural improper, he may also apply for judicial review. 3. The making of surrender arrangements and SFO are very serious matters to both jurisdictions involved. Any fugitive to be surrendered will be handled openly at the court of both places, with members of the public in the know and subject to extensive monitoring. The long-term surrender mechanism under FOO has been operating smoothly and effectively all along for 22 years. Hong Kong SAR has in place extremely stringent procedures for handling SFO requests, with the executive authorities and judiciary performing their respective duties and roles. In order to ensure compliance with all the procedural and legal requirements and protection of the rights of the person concerned. Thank you. Hong Kong, uh, keep up your efforts. Uh, this question was submitted to Let's Code uh, in June. On the 6th, 9th of June, uh, there was a, a rally involving more than a million people. So it seems a long, long time ago. And then now today marks the day of release of Mr. Chen Chong Kai, the suspect involved in that the murder case in Taiwan. People would like to see justice done. And we also want this uh, suspect to be uh, afforded protection as regards fair child and human rights protection. The gov as Hong Kong SAL government should not stay away from these issues. My question is, will the Hong Kong SAL government sit down and talk to the Thai Taiwan government instead of having a shouting match in the air so so that the problems uh, can be resolved instead of the stalemate that we are facing now this uh, the suspect of this uh, Taiwan murder homicide case is uh, released today from the prison he is a free man now he has indicated a wish to surrender himself to Taiwan. Uh, we have taken active steps to f facilitate the suspect's uh, surrender so that we can make a full account of uh, what should have happened to the victim's family, and we hope that, that uh, the Taiwanese authority would uh, actively respond to this uh, development instead of uh, turning this into a manipula uh, political manipu manipulation. We'd like to see justice uphold and uh, the spirit of rule of law respected. We hope that the surrender of the suspect will be handled in the light of these principles. So we want him to be admitted uh, by Taiwan very soon so that the, the legal procedure can follow and the suspect can make amends and turn a new leaf. I hope the uh, Taiwanese authority would uh, actively uh, respond to his uh, re 
wishes. So that uh, the the criminal case can be handled fully, you you are now trying to stay away from the problem. You are now having a shouting match. I was asking whether you are going to sit down with the Taiwanese authority to seek a solution instead of the res making verbal uh, rebuttals uh, again and again. I believe both sides are doing exactly what you have been doing. The SAL government is a very pragmatic. Now we have a free man having been released. He says he wants to surrender himself. The SAL government has no power to impose any uh, restriction on him. We have been uh, trying to help the uh, Taiwanese side, but that they have tried to complicate matters. They have set up obstacles. If the Taiwanese authority accepts the uh, suspect's entry to Taiwan, then we can uh, follow the Hong Kong's own procedures and, all, and uh, render assistance as appropriate. I want to ask this question of Mr. Johnny, who should have stepped down a long time ago. We still don't have a legal framework between the uh, le mutual legal assistance with Taiwan. In this, uh, in this uh, Chen Tong Kai's case, the SAL government has uh, refused time and again the uh, rendering of uh, mutual legal assistance. Now, last night, uh, the SAL government refused uh, Taiwan's uh, request to send someone over to take over the suspect. But the government is also reluctant to provide any information. For example, the statements. Um, from uh, Mr. Chen Tong Kai, the, the evidence related to the case. So this means that uh, there will be no uh, proper trial that because of the lack of evidence. If uh, after Mr. Chen Tong Kai has gone to Taiwan and uh, because of the uh, lack of assistance from the SAL government uh, that, uh, leading to a, a deficiency in the evidence, and a trial trial would become impossible, or he will be uh, acquitted because of lack of procedure. If that happens, how can you explain this to the uh, family of uh, the victim? Well, the uh, member has been speaking very much like a spokesman for uh, Taiwan. Mutual legal assistance is not related to the surrendering of my suspect. Uh, the surrendering of a suspect of his own accord can be done uh, outside the framework of mutual legal assistance. And even uh, in some cases, there may not be uh, MLA agreement when someone uh, wants to surrender himself from another jurisdiction. So the uh, suspect wish to give Given is not related or is not premised on the existence of an MLA agreement. I do not agree that we have not responded to the request from Taiwan. After receiving the letters from the Taiwan, we responded. We 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 have explained what our position in our reply letter. When the request uh, was was received, the suspect was already charged. In Hong Kong, in our court, so we have to make sure whether the uh, information requested uh, will affect the fair the trial of the suspect in the case that will be tried in Hong Kong. And in March this year, we made it clear to Taiwan that we would like to have a meeting to discuss the way forward, but we did not receive a reply to that. So. Uh, what uh, the member has said uh, uh, does not reflect the full account, so uh, this is the disappointing. Uh, we we are of the view that uh, the, this but case should be handled by the legal systems involved, so that someone who is wanted by uh, Taiwan should be allowed to 
go to Taiwan so that the case can be fully resolved. This is this should have been a straightforward case, and now they have put up obstacles based on political considerations. Such a factor should not be the should not play any in any part in a in a court case. I asked a question about mutual legal assistance, and he keeps talking about the surrender of、uh, Mr. Chan Tung Kai himself. If Mr. Chan Tung Kai cannot get a fair trial in Taiwan, there is a likelihood that he will get a very light、uh, sentence or even acquitted, and then justice cannot be done. But、uh, this will be、uh, caused by the SAL government. The government. The SAL government should have、uh, rendered assistance, but it has refused to do so so far. You have raised your question. Please、uh, sit down. I have said that、uh, the provision of、uh, assistance can be rendered、uh, outside any MLA agreement. We would、uh, provide any evidence、uh, to to the best of our. Ability to help the Taiwanese side in handling this particular trial. I've never seen uh, uh, such a shameless、uh, officials, and he's trying to stand truth on his talk. Please、uh, withdraw. Please retract that observation, because it has been ruled as、uh, unparliamentary language. All right, I withdraw that he's shameless, but the people like、uh, John Lee. Is a is someone who whose、uh, true colors are well known. The uh, Taiwan uh, government uh, asked for Mr. Chan Tong Kai to be returned to Taiwan, and who、uh, make a, a big trouble out of this is、um, Mrs. Carrie Lam and and Johnny. Now Taiwan has made it clear. SAL government they asked the SAL government to formally talk to the Taiwan authority so that、uh, this suspect, Mr. Chan Tong Kai, can be returned to Taiwan through a formal、uh, procedure, and then they will send someone here to take him to Taiwan. Why can't it be done? Why is it that at the, during the At the same time,、uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Lee Park、uh, could just disappear in the mainland, and the government turned a bright eye to that. And now you are just putting up a a, a, a gesture of、uh, righteousness,、uh, President. As I've said,、uh, the SAL government is. Willing to do whatever that we can do within the、uh, legal requirements in Hong Kong,、uh, in terms of evidence. Now a suspect want to give himself in. Why are there so many obstacles? If it's a really a matter of、um, political maneuver, or try to unnecessary complicate. The matters, then of course the responsibility rests with the relevant government, which has been doing this. And this person is a wanted person who wants to give himself in. And he wants to turn himself in to the law enforcement.、Uh, Agencies、uh, in questions. Normally,、uh, the law enforcement agency would like to、uh, ask questions or in- examine the questions,、uh, evidence, and uh, the uh, person involved may also have some evidence with him. So as long as it conforms with our legal requirements and laws, we are willing to provide assistance. Which part of the question has not been answered? I asked the SAL government what the SAL government can do to do it formally and seriously, and talk to the、uh, Taiwanese authorities so that、uh, Mr. Chan Tong Kai can actually return to Taiwan. 
And the government is sort of saying that uh, now he wants to surrender himself. It's none of the SAR government's business. Do you have any supplement? No. Last question seeking an oral reply. Mr. Kent Lam. President, in 2014, the government conducted a public consultation on the future fuel mix for electricity generation and put forward two options, namely grid purchase under which electricity would be purchased from the China Southern Power Grid or CSG and local generation under which more natural gas would be used for local electrici electricity generation. A majority of the respondents supported the local option. On the other hand, the government consulted the public from June to September on the long-term decarbonization strategy, proposing, among others, that 80% of the energy supply to Hong Kong should have zero carbon emissions by 2050. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, whether it knows the quantity of electricity currently imported from CSG and its percentage in the overall power supply to Hong Kong, the fuel mix adopted for electricity production and the supply reliability. Two, as the government indicated last July that the CLP Power Hong Kong Limited would enhance the clean energy transmission system with CSG, whether the government knows the details including the quantity of electricity import, the fuel mix adopted for electricity production, the production costs and the progress of the relevant work and three, as the outcome of the public consultation in 2014 showed that a majority of the respondents supported the local generation option, why the government is still heading towards grid purchase, whether it will first focus on promoting the local development of renewable energy or other clean energy to maintain Hong Kong's power, e power autonomy. If so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for the Environment. President, my responses to the three parts of the question are as follows. One, through its Clean Energy Transmission System, or CETS, CLP Power Hong Kong Limited connects its electricity system to the power network of the China Southern Power Grid and the Dia Bay Nuclear Power Station, or DBNPS. CLP has been importing nuclear power from the DBNPS via the CETS since 1994. In 2018, the CETS transmitted about 12,000 million units of electricity from the DBNPS, accounting for around 27% of Hong Kong's total fuel mix for electricity generation. The CETS has maintained steady power supply in recent years, and the system reliability is over 99.99%. Two. The CETS enhancement project currently under planning by CLP will involve the replacement of some 160 kilometers of overhead lines which have been used for more than 25 years with lines that have higher transmission capacity to enhance the overall reliability and transmission capacity of the system. In this connection, a small portion of the overhead line towers will have to be relocated in accordance with the latest technical and environmental requirements. Neither new interconnection circuit nor new network connection point will be added, and the current interconnection arrangement and operation mode will be maintained upon completion of this enhancement project. The estimated capital expenditure on CETS enhancement is about $2 billion. The enhancement project expected to be completed by 2025 will provide Hong Kong with, with greater flexibility in using more clean energy of up to around 30 to 35 percent of our fuel mix, thereby enabling us to achieve our 2030 carbon intensity reduction target, that is reduction of carbon intensity by 65 to 70 percent as compared to the level in the base year of 2005 as much as five years earlier. The CETS can be used to import clean energy generated from various sources, including hydro, wind, and solar energy, or nuclear power. At this stage, 
CLP has yet to decide on the sources of clean energy for its enhanced system, but will need prior approval from the government before it can import more power in the future. Three, as electricity generation accounts for about two thirds of Hong Kong carbon emissions, changing the fuel mix for local electricity generation is the main way of reducing carbon emissions. At present, coal remains the major fuel used for electricity generation in Hong Kong, accounting for around 50% of the fuel mix, while natural gas and non-fossil fuels, including imported nuclear power, each accounts for about 25%. Having regard to the views collected during the public consultation on future fuel mix for electricity generation in Hong Kong in 2014, the two power companies will mainly use more net natural gas to replace coal in electricity generation in the coming decade to help achieve our carbon intensity reduction target by 2030. Having said that, using natural gas for generation still generates carbon emissions. To achieve a carbon reduction target in 2050 that is compliant with the Paris Agreement's well below 2 degrees Celsius target, we will have to use more zero carbon energy. To this end, the government has pressed ahead with promoting the local development of renewable energy or RE. We are taking the lead in enhancing RE development by earmarking $2 billion to implement projects at government premises and are considering the development of large-scale RE projects at several locations in reservoirs and landfills. We have also introduced feed-in tariff and implemented various facilitation measures including suitably relaxing the re restrictions on village house rooftop installations. While there were only some 200 private RE systems connected to the power grids over the last decade, the two power companies have received over 5,300 and approved over 4,500 FIT applications from 2018 to the end of September this year. Besides, we launched Solar Harvest in March to assist eligible schools and non-governmental welfare organizations in installing solar photovoltaic systems. Response to the scheme has been overwhelming with over 210 applications received within three months. Despite the above progress without significant technological breakthrough, Hong Kong only has modest realizable RE potential given our geographical constraint. Many metropolitans in the world face similar, facing similar constraints are moving towards deep carbonization through regional cooperation on clean energy. If we are to achieve Paris agreements well below 2 degree target in the long term, we will have to seriously consider regional cooperation, which may come in various forms. For instance, in terms of clean energy, through investment by the power companies in Hong Kong, or joint research and development on the use of zero carbon energy with regional enterprises, and is thus not confined to grid purchase. Currently, the government is open to different options and has no predetermined position. As invited by the government, the Council for Sustainable Development has just concluded on the 20th of September a three-month public interaction phase of the public engagement on long-term decarbonization strategy. Views collected during this phase have been passed to an independent analysis and reporting agency, that is, the Social Sciences Research Center of HAU for analysis. Upon receiving the Council's recommendations, the government will formulate a long-term decarbonization strategy for Hong Kong, including initiatives to decarbonize the electricity sector. Mr. Cantlap, in the Secretary's reply and in the recent public consultation paper on long-term decarbonization, he talked about regional cooperation to increase the um, proportion of clean energy in the fuel mix. Are you just referring to purchase of electricity from the, south, from the China Southern Power Grid, or are you including other sources? Um, other sources include um, uh, natural gas, etc. So these would not amount to um, only zero carbon energy sources. Like I have explained in my reply, regional cooperation can take different forms. 
it can be facilitated by grid um, purchase as well as other forms. The government remains open in this regard. And I'm sure you would um, agree that we should um, address the calls under the Paris Agreement. In terms of deep carbonization, many major cities of the world are doing so through regional cooperation. So um, through working with the Council for Sustainable Development, we hope to collect views from the public and we can work together on long-term decarbonization. Which part of your question was not answered? Um, he talked about grid purchase, but he did not explain the other options. Like I've explained in the main reply, it can be done through power or energy companies in Hong Kong. They can invest in the region and cooperation can also mean cooperation between power company or energy companies in Hong Kong and the mainland. They can facilitate zero carbon projects before the electricity is transferred or transmitted to Hong Kong. Mr. Michael Lok, thank you. According to the 2018 energy survey, um, Hong Kong has no natural gas and Hong Kong does not produce any fuel. Power is either imported, for example, coal and natural gas, or um, energy can be produced after importing materials, for example, um, gas and electricity. So the so-called power autonomy is a false proposition. If the top priority, well, <coughs> a more pragmatic approach is to focus on reducing carbon emissions. Meanwhile, for low carbon or zero carbon power generation, costs are relatively high. Even natural gas cannot achieve zero emissions. We must consider the tariffs and the affordability of the public, or else we might face um, what we call energy poverty. And um, based on the results of the public engagement on carbon reduction, um, we can see that um, the public do not want to see massive tariff rise. So um, while achieving carbon reduction or in meeting the Paris Agreement's call or the 2030 target, how can we ensure that the tariffs would not be excessively high? Thank you very much. This is a very good question. And um, there are a few aspects to our electricity um, generation policy. It, we must be green and the tariffs or costs must be reasonable. We invited the SDC to engage the public and we have put questions to the public on the um, different things to be considered. Addressing the calls of the Paris Agreement is a global trend, so um, striking a balance is certainly challenging. So through the public interaction, we would solicit the views of the public. As you know, we have um, reduced the reliance on coal in our fuel mix in recent years, and this has um, created pressure on electricity tariffs. And that is why the government has um, introduced a $50 subsidy for households over five years, and this would um, help many households in terms of tariffs. Mr. Kent Lang. Which part of your question was not answered? Are there any new ways to um, provide um, affordable and green energy? Apparently, there has been um, technological breakthroughs in Shanghai and elsewhere. So what is Hong Kong doing now?
to address climate change and facilitate deep decarbonization. Um, many cities in the world are resorting to innovation and technology. So in the coming decades, this is something the Hong Kong government must consider. In the um, SDC's public interaction exercise, so they have consolidated various views and many people have suggested that Hong Kong do more in terms of INT. So the um, developments have been positive. We have tried to embrace innovation. Hong Kong is a small place, so um, we are making use of reservoirs and floating photovoltaic panels. And in the two pilot schemes, you can see that the um, hydropower um, generated um, by the PV panels um, is 20% higher than the power generated at rooftops. So at um, big, bigger reservoirs, for example, the Plover Cove Reservoir, we would introduce more um, photovoltaic panels in order to um, further um, optimize the fuel mix. By working with different governments, uh, government departments, we would make use of various technologies in order to make the best use of space available in Hong Kong. Mr. Cantlang. The government's long-term decarbonization public consultation paper um, focuses on the long-term fuel mix, but in terms of electricity consumption by consumers, are there any plans to encourage the public to consume less electricity? Apparently, um, nothing has been mentioned in this regard. Secretary, thank you very much for your question. The SDC's public engagement document covers different areas of decarbonization, including power generation, conservation, new energy vehicles, waste reduction, etc. The objective is to facilitate um, holistic decarbonization. In terms of um, energy conservation, we are happy to um, take in ideas from the public and the sector. And um, we have been um, thinking about um, ways to conserve energy in Hong Kong. 90% of the energy is consumed in buildings for commercial um, activities and in households. So in terms of buildings, We are. Uh, um, we have launched a scheme with the EMSD for um, to optimize energy calibration in order to save energy for households by working with the power companies. Our goal is to um, transition to smart power meters within seven years in order to serve different consumers by making use of the data, um, energy conservation can be achieved. For the smart meters, we will discuss with all stakeholders, including power companies and the public, to see how we can further conserve energy for the city. Mr. Loi Kwok, thank you. In his main reply, the Secretary talked about developing renewable energy, and I find this positive. With the introduction of feed-in tariff and relaxing the restrictions of village house rooftop installations, the public would be encouraged to um, adopt um, solar energy more extensively. Some people in the new territories ask whether um, further relaxations can be made in order to um, maximize the use of certain um, land, for example, abandoned farmland in the new territories. 
if such sites can be used for farming and solar energy generation at the same time. Well, elsewhere in the world, um, there are such techno technologies in place to allow for um, dual use of such sites. I wonder if the Secretary has specific plans for this and how you can um, relax the um, barriers at um, different government departments. If um, application for land use or a town planning application must be lodged, then the um, process would be very complicated. Thank you very much for the question. The FIT has been introduced for almost one year, and response has been positive. In the last 10 or 20 years, about 200 um, RE systems were connected to power grids, and now we have approved more than 4,000 FIT applications covering different types of premises, including um, schools, households, and commercial buildings. At certain locations, um, installation might contravene certain rules or regulations. So how can we um, uh, overcome these challenges? We have um, almost a year of experience, and we can learn from the um, problems we have encountered. And with the experience learned from these cases, we can um, move forward. We will adjourn till 2.40 p.m.